how can the Baltimore Ravens pull off the perfect trade back in the 2024 NFL draft? We talk about that and so much more coming up next there on this episode of Locked On Ravens. You are Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostriker of Ravens Wire, coming to you from the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for being here, making Locked On Ravens your first listen each and every day. We're free and available on all podcasting platforms. That includes a video form and audio form. Be sure to subscribe either way you prefer to listen or watch five days a week here of Ravens content plus more. Today's episode of Locked On Ravens is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets. Guaranteed that's $150 when or lose. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Whoa, I, I I had been told the new intros were coming. I did not. I forgot, though. I forgot they were coming. So that was a shock to me. It might have been a shock to you if you've been listening to the show every single day and earn every day. Or we do have a new intro. So for almost five years, we've had the same intro on Locked On Ravens. Started off in my first episode, so shout out to my friend Gabe for that. But it's it's a new day on Locked On Ravens. We got the new intro fired up here 10 days before the NFL draft officially begins. So exciting times. That was, that was pretty cool, you know, especially if you're, if you're watching on YouTube or you're listening in audio form. Obviously, the new intro music is there. The cool graphics are there in video form. So well done by, by the team here. We got a lot of great people on this network but it's exciting as again as i talked about 10 days for the draft we have a lot to dive into just in terms of what the ravens could do who they could pick only two more mock draft mondays including today which is kind of crazy to think about we've been doing these for a couple months now but as we do on locked on ravens as we get close to the draft like we are now we did our trade up episode last week which means this week is our trade back episode and then we'll do final predictions for the last mock draft Monday for what my official final mock draft will be. But we have lots to dive into just in terms of, well, the Ravens trading back is a realistic possibility, right? I think more so than trading up. So what does the perfect trade back look like? We'll talk about that today in the first part of the show. Then obviously in the second part, as we always do on mock draft Mondays, I will read off the mock draft that I did. There is a trade back in that to go along with the theme. And then the final part of the show, Mock Draft Mania. We'll get to your mock drafts on Twitter. I'll try to get to as many as I can. Really appreciate all the engagement on those as always. So when it comes to trading back for the Ravens, to me, I think that there is a way that they can execute this that I just think would be like oh, sh- like chef's kiss, like the perfect thing to do. Now, there are a couple of ways that they could approach this. Them picking at 30, if they were to trade back, personally, I don't think a one pick move back is worth it for them. I just don't think that the pick they'd be getting back, it would probably be a, a mid, like a fourth, fifth round pick, which is fine. And if you still have a bunch of guys on your board, you want to pick up that draft capital. Okay. I mean, if, if you want to go back two picks to 32, then, I mean, you could, and maybe that that's a third round pick or something along those lines. If let's say the chiefs really like a guy and they want to move up to 30, then okay. Like that could work. But to me, I'm kind of targeting the beginning of the second round. And I've talked about this before on the show, just in terms of like, if Baltimore were to move to, you know, for the sake of just throwing a pick out there, let's just say pick 35, for example, you're a couple picks into the second round. And that's valuable because you're it's, well, I guess it's a two way street essentially, because it, it depends how you value the fifth year option. Obviously the way the fifth year option has changed over the course of, you know, the last, even if you wanted to call it the last like two or three years, how teams have adjusted based off about the fifth year was changed. So it's not just a flat money option based off of where you were selected. It is now based off of play time based off of accolades. So that can either increase or decrease the value, but it is still important. I think it has changed, but it's not like the value has gone away. So for the Ravens, them losing that by moving into the beginning of the second round, that is something that is valuable that they would lose in this scenario, and I'm not trying to discount that. But on the contrary, if the Ravens don't necessarily view the fifth-year option as something that's uber important to them, and I think some teams view it differently, where obviously some teams do value it a lot because it gives that extra year of team control. 
But if a guy is balling out, like for example, with Kyle Hamilton and Tyler Linderbaum, those fifth year option numbers are going to be super high because I think they're going to hit playtime incentives. They're going to hit accolade incentives. So that number is going to be high. So it's like, all right, well, for that same average annual value, if you just come to the extension, but obviously, you know, sometimes extensions don't work out. And that's where the fifth year option and having that extra year of team control comes into play. But for the Ravens, if they say, yeah, you know what, we're fine. Another team will value that. And since it does have value, it provides more compensation if the Ravens were to move back from 30 to even 33 as opposed to 30 to 31 or 30 to 32. Now, the way that I see it is I would love an extra 2025 pick if I were the Ravens. Eric Acosta during the pre-draft press conference or a liar's luncheon, if you want to call it that. I ended up talking about how this class is a little quote unquote weaker. There's aren't as many guys just because of the NIL rules. And obviously with the opportunity to make that money, guys are staying. <laughs> it's just, it, it is what it is, right? You have a lot of people, especially, you know, you talk about these juniors and even underclassmen who are being advised to stay in college as long as possible for the option to get that essentially could be life-changing money there. A lot of the time it is life-changing money. So the way that that is this, this year, next year might be like the balancing act and balancing all that out. So to me, like a 2025 second would be perfect. You move back a couple of spots, 30 to 35, 30 to 36, 30 to 34. And you pick up an extra second round pick on top of that in 2025, maybe like a fifth rounder. Maybe you, you have to move, one of your seventh round picks or one of your fifth round picks, I'd be okay with that. So to me, it's it's perfect because the way that the Ravens and a lot of these teams work, and I, I've talked about this so much on the show, if you're an everyday, you're probably just like, oh, again. But yes, I have to re-explain it. For a lot of these teams, when you get to a pick, you have probably, depends, maybe two to seven or maybe eight guys that you really, really like at that spot. So if you were to move back, if you're the Ravens, let's say move back from 30 to 34, move back four spots, essentially five spots, essentially. If you have seven guys you like, you're risking that maybe some of the, t- the guys who are ranked above others might not be there, but you still feel comfortable enough with a guy that falls to 34 that you would have taken at 30 and you get that extra draft capital. So I'm just, I don't know, I'm enamored with the fact of, of getting another second round pick. And it doesn't even have to be for the draft. Like we literally saw the Texans move off of their first round pick this year. They moved off, I think it was 23, and they got a bunch of seconds from Minnesota. And they used one of those seconds, the second round pick in 2025, to trade for Stephon Diggs. And obviously the Ravens value their draft capital. It's something they're going to have to rely on, especially as I've talked about on this show before in the post Lamar Jackson world of, you know, him off of his rookie deal post Lamar Jackson world still with the Ravens, obviously, but it's no longer Lamar rookie contract. It's not only about Lamar here. It's about all these other big contracts coming down the pipeline and Matabike's deal kicking in and it's all these other things. So to me, I think that the Ravens have an opportunity here. I'm not mad if they stick and pick at 30, if there's a guy they love at 30 and you're, you're thinking like that Kyle Hamilton, where it's like, why is this guy here? Of course we're going to take him, right? Like if that's what the Ravens are thinking, then yeah, I'm not mad at that. But there is added opportunity to get draft capital. And we know, we know how much Eric DaCosta and the Ravens love to maneuver up and down that draft board. So in my opinion, I think that Baltimore could really be looking at a trade back here. 30, I, it's, I know it's not like this, beautiful spot to be picking it's essentially already the beginning of the second round just with the fifth year option attached but at the end of the day i think you can capitalize being there especially for a team maybe there's a quarterback like uh, michael Penix who falls to the end of the first round and a team really like the lamar jackson thing right baltimore traded up back into the first round to take lamar if a team really likes michael Penix, maybe they trade up to 30 and give up a little more to get there baltimore has a really cool opportunity And if we're talking trade up versus trade back, like I think trading up would be really cool. I think if there's a guy that starts falling, you have to think about, okay, well, they have nine picks. They're going to getting a ton of compensatory picks next year. There's there's an option for them to be trading up. But at the same time, it does just feel like trading back is more realistic. And hey, you know what? You can trade back to 33, 34, 35, 36. And I'm sure one of Tyler Guyton, Jordan Morgan, Keon Coleman, 
Xavier Leggett, right? Some of those guys are going to be there. Plus, you get maybe an extra second round pick in 2025, an extra third round pick. You upgrade a pick, let's say. So all those things really intriguing possibilities to me. And coming up in the second part of the show, I'll talk about my mock draft that I did for today and look at my trade. I did a trade back. We'll talk about what it means for the Ravens and then go through the prospects as usual. Stay tuned a lot to get to on Lockdown Ravens. First, the show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience, the formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors is everything you need to maintain your vehicle. Level it up to peak performance, superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're in the speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts, your number one ride or die will always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Visit eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want to season to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins, keep Rad or Die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusion to apply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. We're back. Our second segment of Locked On Ravens here. Kevin Ostriker still talking with you. I'm fired up today. We got the new intro going, which, again, I, I knew was coming, but I forgot was coming. So I, was, uh, I hit the intro, and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like, what, what is this? But it was really cool. Obviously, the music. And the graphics, really, really cool graphics. But both audio form and video form, I'm I'm hopeful you enjoy the new intro. And now we're talking about Mock Draft Monday with the draft being 10 days away. Nine picks for the Ravens. So, like, it's a pretty decent amount. I don't know how many Baltimore's going to end up with, but I wouldn't be shocked if they were to make some moves and try to get as many swings as they could, even though this is kind of a quote-unquote weaker class once again. Let's get into my mock draft I did. I'm pulling it up quickly here. This one, I mean, admittedly, this wasn't my favorite I've done. I felt like the board fell really poorly to me in this. A lot of the offensive linemen I wanted were gone. And it just, it felt like even though I I liked the trade that happened, like I think the trade that I got was really quality value. The, the prospects, and there are a lot that we didn't talk about. If you're new to the show, I do these, and I, I flip up the prospects we do. I switch it up mostly every week, so we're not talking about the same prospect over and over and over again on the show. So, you know, sometimes there's a guy that I should have taken here, but I already took him a couple weeks ago, so we try to move and do a bunch of different prospects on this show. So I did trade back from 30 in this scenario, and I, I did really like the value. I, I mean, admittedly, there were a lot of trades. There were some where I got, like, there were teams that were offering me like five picks in this same class for two. And I'm like, all right, that's, that's a little too much. I did a two for two swap. There was as much as I talked up getting a 2025 pick in the first segment. I did not do that in this. I wanted to do one that was just this year's picks for the sake of the mock draft simulator. So I traded 30 and 250 for 33 and 101. I thought this was really good value for moving back essentially only three, four spots. Now, Adonai Mitchell was the pick at 30. Obviously, if that's the real life scenario, I'm sticking at 30 and I'm picking AD Mitchell. But I still thought that, again, moving back three, four spots and upgrading 250 to 101, you get a pick just outside the top 100. So I'm I'm calling that four picks in the top 100. Like it's literally 101. You, you have five picks, or I guess six picks in the top 130, if you want to call it that. So I thought that this was overall, you upgrade that, uh, what that pick 250, 150 spots to move back three or four spots. Like, th- that's great value for me. Now, I did go the wide receiver route. AD Mitchell was the pick at 30. At 33, I took Keon Coleman, the wide receiver from Florida State. I know there are a bunch of mixed opinions on Keon Coleman. Some people love Keon Coleman. Other people are saying, please, Ravens, stay far away from Keon Coleman. I personally like Keon Coleman. He's not my favorite one of these wide receivers in this range. Like, obviously, A.D. Mitchell. I'm a big Xavier Leggett guy. I think he's a really prime target. I I have a sneaking suspicion, though, Leggett goes in, like, the final. Like, I wouldn't be shocked if Baltimore picked him at 30, if we're being honest. But I think he goes in those final five picks of the first round. If you've been listening to me for a while on this show, I've kind of had him pegged in in that like T Higgins, Michael Pittman Jr. 33, 34 range. Like I traded for the Ravens here, 
But I don't know. I, just, I feel like like I could see him going to Kansas City at 32. Like just I'm just that'd be brutal. But just imagine like I could honestly see it. But Coleman is someone you can play both from the slot and put him on the outside. I mean, he, he has the versatility. Someone that I think still fits that bigger bodied player. And at the end of the day, that's what Baltimore needs. Obviously, with the signing of Deontay Hardy as well, like Hardy's five six, and honestly, that's more of a special team signing than any other. I mean, he's going to play some wide receiver, but Keon Coleman's a six four guy. Like he goes up there, he catches those contested passes. The Ravens need a bigger bodied player. They have Zay Flowers. Bateman is not small, but you know he's not that go up and get the ball type guy. I think Coleman has that versatility. I would not be mad with Keon Coleman. Is he my favorite receiver up in the Ravens range? No, but I still think that you're trading back into the second round. You're getting that extra pick move up. Coleman was the guy who was available. I actually think Leggett was gone. I think he went before Coleman. Or no, I, I can't remember, but... I've taken Leggett so many times. I haven't taken Coleman at all. I just, I felt like it was time to talk about Coleman because he is a realistic possibility falling into that range. I'm not a big Xavier worthy guy. He was also available. That's personally not a pick I'm going to make at all throughout this process. Cause I personally don't really love him for the Ravens, but I think Coleman would be fine. Like if it was Coleman in the first round, I'm personally not complaining about that. So the Ravens, obviously in this scenario, they keep their second round pick. I took Cameron Kitchens, the safety from Miami here at 62. This is a very controversial pick, I feel like, because everybody's Ravens and a safety. They don't need a safety. Why are you spending a second-round pick? Every offensive lineman I wanted was gone. There were no edge guys I wanted. All the corners I wanted, I, I didn't want to reach. This was pure best player available. Like, I am I personally, I get needs. And look, the Ravens kind of operate this way too. But I'm not going to go and reach for a third or fourth round grade when there's nobody at a position of need in the second round, I'm going to wait for those guys. And in the meantime, I'm going to take a guy who was higher on my board. And that's, I do like the best player available strategy in that way. Cause I don't want to reach a round or two for a guy that I know is going to be there with my next pick. And so I took Cameron Kinchins here. Someone that I feel like he didn't test. Well, I, he hurt his stock during the testing period of this whole process, but he's super versatile great instincts. And I think he can feel like it's a superstar backfield of Kyle Hamilton, Kitchens, and Marcus Williams. Like you want a stud to fill that Geno Stone role. I know I'm giving it to our Darius Washington. Personally, I personally think the Ravens make this pick. I can honestly see Kitchens going like at the end of the first, early second, but again, he shouldn't have been available at this point. So I'm like, you know what? Let's do it. 93. I took Christian Mahogany, the offensive guard from Boston college. In this mock draft, you know, I've taken a lot of tackles throughout my time doing these things, obviously penciling them in the plug and play, but I haven't really taken a guard as my first offensive lineman a ton. And I think that Mahogany can come and fill in one of those either left guard or right guard spots. I know a lot of people have already kind of penciled in Ben Cleveland and Andrew Voorhees as those two options, but I don't, I don't hate Mahogany coming in and challenging those guys and then giving Daniel Falele a shot to win that starting job. Maybe Josh Jones. I mean, that's not super inspiring now that I'm kind of saying it out loud, but it's going to be interesting because Morgan Moses is gone. How much do you trust a Daniel Falele to go and take over that role? I think Patrick McCary is still good as a super sixth offensive lineman. So it's going to probably come down to that. So I took a guard this time around again, just trying to switch it up. But all the tackles were gone. Literally all the tackles I wanted were taken before pick 62. When usually there's still at least one guy I like at 93. So that was a little interesting, but you got to take what the mock draft simulator gives you. Obviously that comes both with the players that fall and when there's not a great board in front of you. Then with pick 101, I took Austin Booker, the edge from Kansas Edge is not as big of a need for Baltimore anymore in the draft after re-signing Kyle Van Noy, so I wasn't as pressed to go and, like, tr you know, if Chop Robinson was there, take him, or, you know, there were a bunch. Like, Brandon Dorless fell. A while. I think he actually got taken at 100, and I was going to take him, but then Austin Booker was the next guy. There are a lot of really quality edge rushers that are going to fall into that, like, 80 to 120 range that could be taken mid-third, mid fourth, like in that Booker is one of those. And I think he's someone that you don't have to rely on for a big production because you're hoping at least, and again, it's hoping that Adafi Owe 
can step up next to Cal Van Noy. Maybe a Jabo can give you some stuff. Tavius Robinson as well. Maybe they sign a guy, but I do like Austin Booker as a prospect. Then I took Kalen King, corner from Penn State at 113. Kalen King I've taken a couple times. Kyrie Jackson was taken. He is my guy in this draft. Unfortunately, he was gone at this point, so couldn't take him. King did not test very well. He hurt himself throughout the process here, but still a highly touted guy. Did have success at Penn State. Obviously played opposite of Joey Porter Jr. over there. Wouldn't be mad at him as a depth piece. I think, again, the Ravens need a third corner, third outside guy. King could probably fill that role. Jalen Wright running back from Tennessee at 130. Haven't taken Jalen Wright before. You know, I've taken the Blake Corns of the world, waited till the seventh round and taken like Imani Vidal or, you know, Isaac Garendo. But Jalen Wright is a really quality player. You know, I prefer one of the Braylon Allens or Corums. I, you know, Ray Davis. But I think Wright's a really, really good player. And at 130, I think it was a little bit of a steal, honestly. Then at 165, I took Gabe Hall, defensive lineman from Baylor. This was the best player available pick as well. Baltimore does not need an edge rusher, obviously. Or not an edge rusher, a defensive lineman, excuse me. But this is a guy, Gabe Hall, that can play a little bit, is like a defensive end and then kick inside and play some big defensive line. Not really projected as a pass rusher at the next level, but is a really good run stuffer. And I think that complements what Baltimore has really well because – I think Matabike did have some struggles in the run game last season. I thought it was fine, but did have some struggles, but he's an incredible pass rusher. Travis Jones, I think, is more of your, like, he can do it all. He's a good run stuffer and a good pass rusher. And then Gabe Hall is almost kind of like, okay, yeah, great run stuffer, but as a pass rusher, can sometimes struggle. So I think it was the best of both worlds, honestly, with that pick that he com- he just compliments everybody well. Then I took Frank Crum at 218 and Jacob Monk at 228. Jacob Monk is one of my late round guys. I always take him at 228. And then Frank Crum is someone who, again, more of a developmental tackle prospect, not going to come in to start day one, but I ended up with three offensive linemen here. So I was, I was pleased. I mean, it wasn't my favorite mock draft I've done. I've, I've definitely had others I were, I was more excited about, but even when the board falls to you in a way you don't want, you got to take what the simulator gives you. And I feel like this was a, a balance of, taking some needs, and taking some best players available as well. Coming up, though, we'll be getting into your mock drafts from Twitter, talking about any trade-ups, trade-backs, picks, and more. Stay tuned. we got a lot to get to on the show. First, this episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I've been told personally I'm a competitive person, and I, I definitely am. I've been told by friends, by family, and yeah, I have a competitive side. We all do. And my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part for me personally is messing with my friends. I mean, a bunch of my friends love Monopoly. And so what I can do is I can charge a rent on my iconic property, just like the classic Monopoly. But now I can also, you can rob the vaults of the riches for myself and leaderboards show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in on the game and join your friends. Tell them Monopoly go now free on the App Store or Google Play. And the show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets. Guaranteed that's $150 bucks when or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that's safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet an automatic win. Hopefully, the Denver Nuggets have a lot of automatic wins in these playoffs. Is if you didn't know, I'm a big Denver Nuggets fan. They got the number two seed. Really big win against the Timberwolves, really unfortunate loss against the Spurs, and then a win against the Grizzlies to round out their year. So they'll be playing after the Pelicans or the Lakers in the first round. Really excited for that. So be sure to check out FanDuel for everything NBA playoffs. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. We're back. Our final segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Ostriker still talking with you here on this Monday. Really appreciate everybody for tuning in today, making Locked On Ravens your first listen each and every day. Be sure to subscribe to us both in video form and audio form. You can subscribe for the new intro, right? I I I think that earns a little bit of a... uh, a subscription. So really appreciate everybody for the support, video form, audio form, social media, subtext. We have a bunch of great communities. As I mentioned, been doing this for almost five years now. So we've been through a lot of ups and a lot of downs here when you're talking about the Ravens, but it's been really fun to cover the team all the way through. And we're talking Ravens five days a week here. So Monday through Friday, plus we do bonus episodes. Next week, we're going to be doing literally, I think, 
four, three straight days with a live stream. We'll have bonus episodes for three straight days. We're going to have probably 10 or 12 episodes of the show and usually we only do five just because of the draft. So that's really exciting as well. Let's get into some mock drafts from Twitter again. How I do this, and this is notes for not only next week, but for next year, is I put out a mock draft Sunday, and then I retweet that, quote tweeted on the Locked on Ravens account. And then below that quote tweet, you can comment your mock drafts to be talked about on our Monday show. So we're going to, we're going <laughs> to, I see we have, we have Joe Radke in here who, J- Joe, Joe, if you're familiar with the Ryan Ripken show, Joe is all up in those comments and He's a big Arkansas guy. We we learned actually with Heston Kerstad, the one of the Orioles' top prospects. We learned the uh, Woo Pig Suey, the the Arkansas chant. So Joe says, "Take them all. Can't go wrong." And it is literally, I think, every single Arkansas player in this draft. <laughs> so we have centers, corners, defensive linemen. So Joe is all over the Arkansas. So just, just wanted to give a shout out to Joe. Then we have Stephen Meyer, eighteen here, thirtieth pick, Brian Thomas Jr who says X was all a buzz earlier in the week about our track record with second round picks and the utility of those picks this year and next in trade. I think I had a hand in that. Actually, I put that tweet out and everybody went crazy. And also uh, Steven says this mock explores that, but not only trading away the second this year and next, but next year's first and 93 in doing so I took two blue chip players in my opinion. So Steven trades 14 and one, or no, he trades 30, 93 and a 2025 20, second, excuse me, for 14 and 190. Troy Faltanu tackle from Washington is the selection. Then Steven trades 62 and round one in 2025 20, for 22 and 120. Brian Thomas Jr., LSU wide receiver, is the pick there. Tyrone Tracy, Purdue, running back, is the pick at 113. Elijah Jones, Boston College corner at 120. Christian Jones, Texas tackle at 130. Brayden McGregor, Mich- Michigan edge at 165. Brandon Coleman, TCU tackle at 190. Tanner Bortoloni, the Wisconsin center at 218. Dominique Hampton, the Washington safety at 228. And Jordan McGee, Temple linebacker at 250. Now, I love Fautanu and Brian Thomas. Like, if you're talking about maximizing a window for Lamar Jackson – getting some guys that you know can be studs. Faltano, I think, is literally a plug-and-play guy. He has versatility. Like, there's no question. And Brian Thomas Jr., we have seen kind of climb up those draft boards. I expect him to be gone far before the Ravens pick at 30. Now, trading away the first in 2025 does give me a little pause. I just – I feel like the firsts are so valuable. Now, essentially, it's almost like what the Saints and Eagles did a couple of years ago where both teams get two firsts. So – this is interesting because the Eagles are a part of this. So Baltimore is essentially getting two first round guys this year, and they would not have a first round pick next year. It's just a matter of how you like this class. I know that obviously Steven's a big Brian Thomas Jr. guy, so it doesn't necessarily shock me. But the wait from 22 to 113 is really long. <laughs> that, that's a really long wait. I'm not saying that Fao Tanu or Brian Thomas Jr. is not worth that wait. That's essentially a 90 pick wait. And we've seen. A lot of guys, I mean, when the Ravens traded that second rounder for Lamar in 2019, well, they, you know, they got him in 2018, but they traded the 2019 second. Like that was a long wait. 90 picks, especially when you're foregoing the entirety of day two, that that is a long wait. So maybe I'd try to package some of the later round picks, like instead of 93, maybe I'd try to package like 120 and 130. I'm just kind of spitballing here, but I think that if they still had 93, it'd be a lot like, even though it's only a 20 pick difference, essentially, it's still a much easier weight because you still have a day two pick. So I, I, I like the idea here. I like the prospects, but it is it is a bit of a long wait. And trading the first round pick is a little bit interesting as well. But hey, you know what? I, I like the idea. Now let's do something here from Shane Cardi 29, who has the Ravens. It's a trade. I can't see what the trade is, but they traded with the Chiefs for 32. They took Jordan Morgan, tackle from Arizona at 32. Byron Murphy, the second defensive lineman from Texas at 62. Johnny Wilson, Florida State wide receiver, 93. Mike Sandstrill, the corner from Michigan at 95. Jalen Wright, running back in the seat at 113. Cam Hart, corner from Notre Dame at 130. Xavier Thomas, edge from Clemson, 165. Sal Tyler Laumia, I hope I said that right. Guard from Utah at 218. Mark Perry, safety from DCU at 228. And Frank Crum, Wyoming offensive lineman at 250. This is, per, I mean, this is great because I think it was 32 and 95 for 30, maybe. I'm, I'm trying to put the trade together. But you move back two spots, three spots. 
You get a Jordan Morgan who, again, the fifth-year option is still in play here with that 32, and then you get 95, so you have four picks in the top 100. Offensive line, defensive line, wide receiver, corner, edge is not as big of a need, so I think I, I'll, I'll let that pass. Still, Shane gets an edge at 165. Interesting idea. I think that it'd be really cool for the Ravens to, again, move back only one or two or three or four spots and get that much value in a trade. That's all I have you here today, though, on Locked on Ravens. Really appreciate everybody for tuning in to the show. Appreciate everybody for being here. Kind of, it's a, it's a new day, a new age on Locked on Ravens with that new intro. Almost five years of the same intro. Now we're in a new era. So exciting stuff here on the show. Be sure to like this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also an audio form, if that's how you prefer. If you're listening in audio form, really appreciate you as well as obviously our video watch as well. Be sure to follow along anywhere you get your favorite podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the whole nine yards that are coming up tomorrow. More Ravens content as we creep closer and closer to the NFL draft. Stay tuned. I'll see you right back here tomorrow on Lockdown Ravens.